ADB's East Asia Forum this year focuses on decarbonizing Asia and the Pacific. ADB's experience in green development in East Asia has much to contribute to the decarbonization dialogue and efforts in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. We hope that you will join our discussions at the East Asia Forum. Be part of the conversations on decarbonization and climate change in Asia Pacific. Adult one, welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining the East Asia Forum 2022. Let us now begin the forum. I'll give the floor to Ms. Teresa Ko, Director General of East Asia Department of ADB. She will chair the um, opening session. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Akiko. Distinguished guests, speakers, panelists, participants. On behalf of the Asian Development Bank, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the first ever East Asia Forum. In this forum, we have been fortunate to have as our partner, the ADBI or ADB Institute. And we are pleased to know that ADB Vice President Ahmed Saeed, Vice President for East Asia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, as well as Dean Tetsushi Sonobe, Dean of ADBI will open this session. Allow me to first call Vice President Ahmed Saeed. VP Saeed is currently ADB's Vice President for Operations 2, where he is responsible for ADB's operations in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Prior to ADB, VP Saeed served in senior roles at the US Treasury, where he was an advisor for Middle East and Africa to the Secretary of the Treasury, and was deeply involved in significant debt relief exercises and laid the basis for what became the Santiago Principles for Sovereign Wealth Fund. VP Saeed was also head of JP Morgan's coverage for finance ministry, central banks and sovereign wealth funds across the Middle East and North Africa. VP Saeed is currently in Washington DC but has prepared a video message for us. Let us listen to VP Saeed's message. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the first ever ADB East Asia Forum. Since I joined ADB almost exactly three years ago, I have been thinking hard about how we as an organization can work with our developing member countries to move the needle on key development issues. A large part of that time has been spent in helping guide our institution's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are three lessons for the battle against climate change that I hope to share with you that I draw from this deeply scarring experience. The first is that much like issues of global health, the decarbonization process is a key part of the development agenda. There is only one kind of development and that is green development. Just as one cannot fully enjoy the fruits of prosperity without health, we also cannot develop at the expense of our environment. This is of course, no surprise to many of you. The second is that the greatest and most significant challenges ahead lie at the intersection of various disciplines. To address climate change, we must integrate thinking about finance, technology, and policy, all in new ways and at a deeper level than before, much as COVID has forced us to integrate epidemiological insights with macro forecasting, for example. And the final point is that just as the instruments, institutions, and coordinating ecosystem must evolve to respond to COVID, so too they will need to change and adapt at a structural level to be successful in the fight against climate change. In all these and in other ways, COVID-19 should be understood both as a tragedy in its own right, as well as a dress rehearsal for an even greater challenge, the looming climate crisis. We all collectively share this planet. And COVID-19 tells us that if we don't solve our problems in one place, they will overwhelm us in others. But with that warming, warning also comes an opportunity to collaborate and to build something that meets the challenge of the present time. Climate change is the biggest risk we confront. 
Great power rivalries come and go. The world has certainly seen them before. But climate change is a challenge to human civilization. And we will either meet this challenge in some fashion, or we will leave a legacy of failure for our children. In ADB, we see that more and more, the subject of climate change is the single cross-cutting theme that affects everything we do. We cannot improve the lot of women if we don't address climate change. We cannot uplift the poorest of our societies who get hurt more than others if we do not address the consequences of climate change. This is why I'm so pleased that in its first year, the East Asia Forum has decided to focus on decarbonizing Asia and the Pacific as its topic of discussion. As we look forward, let me make four points about the path ahead. First, we will not succeed if we continue to talk about climate transition as something the developing world must do in order to atone for the sins of those who prospered before them. We currently have a paradigm that talks about climate transition as a burden sharing process. For example, this idea of $100 billion that will be transferred from polluters to those now seeking to grow. This is unfortunately a very inadequate framework. In fact, if we are able to scale decarbonization technologies and to continue to drive down their cost, the world we transition to can be better in every way than the one we are leaving, cleaner and cheaper. I think that such a paradigm shift really must happen in the developing world, and we must pivot from a model where we view climate change as something that we are being asked in developing countries to do by others, and to pivot to recognizing that this may in fact be the greatest development opportunity we have ever seen, that the kind of capital that can flow to developing countries and the kind of skills and high quality jobs that can come with it are unparalleled in recent history. This is what I have come to call decarbonization as development. Developing countries have an opportunity to establish a beachhead in the technologies and industries of the future and to win the fight for productivity enhancing FDI. Second, we must explore new ways of thinking about the macroeconomics of climate transition or more broadly, the macroeconomics of paradigm changes. For example, do existing climate mitigation models do a good job of incorporating best in class insights about the trajectory of price associated with core decarbonization technologies? This is an extraordinarily important point because if you underestimate price moves downwards, we may end up with poor investment choices. Besides that, system-wide structural transformations that are driven by fast evolving disruptive technologies must be better understood and integrated as key elements of the climate transition process. Unfortunately, the current macro modeling approaches commonly deployed for climate change are based mostly on conventional single equilibrium frameworks focused on policy choices on the margin of optimally efficient systems. Such appro approaches do not pay sufficient attention to the role of diffusion of disruptive technologies that could accelerate the pace of decarbonization, nor to the feedback loops between public sector policy choices and the price curves of such technologies. Driving prices down will bring the goal of decarbonization nearer in the future and will allow for win-win climate outcomes. Third, we're all in this together, but we will need to learn how to work together. This broad ecosystem of diverse actors must focus on its unique strengths and improve collaboration. Multilateral development banks like ADB will of course have a key role to play in this process. I would include one ADB and knowledge work here and I'm very proud to see that this East Asia Forum will culminate in a very important session on deepening partnerships and the launch of the one ADB knowledge working group, which has been set up to facilitate knowledge transfers across ADB's developing member countries. Besides knowledge, partnerships are critical because the investment needs are enormous. Such sums will not be achievable through the public sector alone, and we will need the private sector to step up in a big way. But the fact that the private sector needs to act doesn't mean that the private sector has all of the tools it needs at its disposal. In particular, the interface with government is absolutely critical. The underlying investment needs for climate transition are often described as an enormous cost, but in fact, they are largely good investments that will earn a positive economic, financial, and or social return. Despite this, we often do not see funds flow, in part because of failures in financial intermediation. 
Institutions like ADB will need to step up our work to facilitate the process by which market intermediaries are developed with the right profile, the right kind of investment return targets, for example, or the right kind of duration capacity. My fourth and last comment is that collaboration only thrives in a context of common purpose. Whatever in any organization's intermediary success metrics are, when it comes to climate change, we must all be focused on adherence not only to process, but on fidelity to ultimate purpose. The question is not how much green finance did you mobilize or whether your bond fits within a certain taxonomy. It is whether you move the needle forward on eliminating GHG outcomes. That is a question that we can embed in process, but process alone will, not, will be insufficient to ensure a good outcome. Good outcomes will only come from individuals and institutions that share common purpose. I'd like to conclude with a reminder that the battle against climate change will be won or lost in the Asia Pacific region. What are we willing to do to win this battle? Let us collectively let us collectively share our experience, thoughts, and ideas in this forum. But even more importantly, let us challenge ourselves to collectively act, design, and implement concrete initiatives to reach carbon neutrality. This will be a long journey, but it has begun, and the destination is already within sight. Let me end with thanks to Ma Jun, to all of our speakers, to the participants, and finally, to my own colleagues in the East Asia Department of the ADB for coming up with a strong concept for this forum for bringing together an exceptional cast of speakers and for recognizing the importance of facilitating knowledge transfer across the Asian Development Bank's developing member countries. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be with you. Thank you very much, VP Said, for the very important message all the way from Washington, DC. Our next speaker is no other than the Dean and CEO of the ADB Institute, the Tokyo-based research and capacity building arm of ADB. Dean Tetsushi Sonobe has researched extensively on economic development, particularly the roles of industrial clusters, human capital, management practices, and market competition in industrial development in developing Asia and other regions. Before joining ADBI, Dean Sonobe served as a vice president of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo. He is a recipient of the Nikkei Book Publication Prize and the Masayoshi Ohira Memorial Prize and a founding board member of the Japanese Association for Development Economics. Allow me to call in Dean Tatsushi Sonobe to please give his remarks. Thank you, Teresa, for a very kind introduction. Chairman Dr. Majun, Executive Director Mr. Richard Baron, Director General Mr. Lee Gao, uh, ADB Vice President Dr. Ahmed Said, uh, distinguished presenters, panelists, session chairs, and all participants. Good afternoon from ADBI in Tokyo. Welcome everyone to East Asia Forum 2022. I'm, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to provide some opening remarks. The forum this year focuses on decarbonization in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice President Said, for the excellent opening remarks, setting the tone for the forum. This year marks ADBI's 25th anniversary. During the last 25 years, ADBI, with the help of ADB and other partners, has contributed to developing and disseminating knowledge relevant to policy planning, implementation, and evaluation concerning climate change mitigation and adaptation. The theme of the last annual conference of ADBI, uh, which, had, which was held uh, last December, was climate change mitigation. We chose the topic because uh, sustainable global economic recovery uh, necessitates uh, universal access to clean energy, energy security, and uh, affordability, and the transition to low carbon energy and circular economy uh, globally. We chose the topic also because the conference 
our conference was held just before, uh, sorry, just after uh, COP26 was closed. We invited world-class experts, including COP26 President Mr. Rok Sharma, uh, to discuss uh, various aspects of the issue deeply. And it had a large number of participants and was well received by them. We will publish an open access book, a selected collection of the papers uh, presented at the conference, hopefully in less than six months. Now, ADBI is very happy to be part of this East Asia Forum to discuss the same issue, paying attention to new developments. Just before ADBI's annual conference, COP26 discussed how to bridge good intentions with measurable actions, and so the governments agreed on the need for much greater support to developing countries and agreed to explore ways of increasing actions to close the current emissions gap. Many of us thought that these agreements would make a sustainable global economic recovery possible. Today, however, a sustainable global economic recovery faces significant challenges. They were not foreseen during COP26. At that time, we saw only some symptoms of inflation and the interest rate rises in a few spots of the global north. The Russian invasion of Ukraine changed the world and posed unprecedented challenges, ranging from humanitarian tragedy to worsening food insecurity and the shortage of energy and materials. They reduced already constrained fiscal spaces available for post-pandemic recovery, deny low-income countries access to and affordability of clean energy, and impede multilateralism's effectiveness. They are not just hindering economic recovery from pandemic, but derailing the energy transitions required to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The theme of East Asia Forum 2020 is most timely and relevant to these concerns. To overcome the unprecedented challenges, we need to share a good understanding of what technologies and financial, institutional, and partnership arrangements are available for decarbonization in Asia and the Pacific, and what actions are measurable and likely to accelerate the just transition in the region. I'm happy that Director General Teresa, uh, Director General <laughs> Teresa Ko and the organizing team have developed a very good agenda covering relevant issues nicely, including effective decarbonization planning and actions, transforming cities into carbon neutral and circular economy, regulating pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions, transition to low-carbon rural development, particularly but not limited to low-carbon livestock farming, and finance and partnership. I'd like to express my gratitude to many experts and policymakers for joining us today and tomorrow to share their insights and experiences. I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Teresa. Thank you very much, Dean Sonobe, for the very insightful remarks. Let me now invite our distinguished keynote speaker for 2022 East Asia Forum, Dr. Ma Jun. He's a well-respected figure in sustainable finance. He is currently the president of the Institute of Finance and Sustainability in Beijing and the chairman of the Green Finance Committee of the China Society for Finance and Banking. He concurrently co-chairs the G20 Sustainable Working Group, Sustainability Financing Working Group, and the International Platform on Sustainable Finance Working Group. He has held key positions in the People's Bank of China, 
where he was a member of the People's Bank of China Monetary Policy Committee and the chief economist of the PBOC Research Bureau. He also served as director of the Center for Finance and Development at the Tsinghua University, the chief economist for Greater China at the Deutsche Bank, senior economist at the World Bank, and economist at the IMF. He holds a PhD, a doctoral degree in economics from Georgetown University and a master's degree for, from Fudan University. Today, he will be sharing with us his thoughts on what it takes to develop a framework for financing climate transition. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Majun. Thank you very much, Teresa. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Well, thanks again uh, for the invitation. It's really my great honor and pleasure to be uh, part of this uh, East Asian Forum on Decarbonization. Um, I have prepared a slide. Um, let me try to uh, upload. Can you see this, Teresa? Yes. yes. Please Great. go ahead. Yeah. Um, now the topic I'm given is on transition finance. So uh, I'm calling this a framework for financing climate transition. Um, the background of this talk is that uh, the G20 has uh, uh, already formed a consensus to develop a transition finance framework. Uh, this is uh, you know, part of the reason uh, why I have actually quite a few um, contents to share. And the other thing is that uh, China itself uh, is working on developing a transition finance policy and started experimenting uh, with some banks and uh, regions uh, with transition finance. So with this backdrop, uh, I'd like to um, discuss uh, three topics. One is uh, the framework itself. Uh, what are the key elements uh, we need to uh, design a proper uh, policy framework for transition finance? And secondly, uh, uh, just a very light touch on the uh, China uh, experience in the past year uh, in uh, this area. And finally, a few remarks on the implication for Asia, uh, especially for ADB. Um, as uh, you probably know, um, Italian presidency of G20 last year uh, re-established the uh, G20 sustainable finance. Um, initially, it's called the study group. And uh, later on, during the middle of last year, it was upgraded to a G20 sustainable finance working group. A major delivery of this uh, working group last year was the uh, G20 Sustainable Finance Roadmap. Within the roadmap, the uh, G20 stated clearly that uh, we need to develop a transition finance framework. And uh, the reason is actually quite simple. Um, there are lots of uh, carbon intensive activities in the economy and they need to be financed for them to transit towards um, low carbon and uh, zero carbon operation. And most of these operations uh, are unable to get financing from the current uh, so-called green or sustainable financial system, uh, largely because uh, the way green and sustainable finance label activities are close to what we call pure green activities. And those currently carbon intensive, uh, even though in the future they can become low carbon, are not classified as pure green. And that's why the current green sustainable financial system is unable to accommodate a large part of the demand coming from the carbon intensive sector for financing. And that's why it's calling for a uh, new framework which can clarify what activities belong to transition, uh, what activities uh, uh, need to be disclosed in order to qualify a transition finance supported uh, transaction and what kind of uh, instruments, I'm talking about financial instruments that need to be developed to support such transition of carbon intensive company. So we broadly agreed uh, at the G20 level that uh, the uh, framework needs to have five key elements. One is what we call identification of transition activities. Namely, we need to define clearly what are the qualified transition activities. And secondly, how to disclose such activity in order to avoid a uh, green wash or transition wash, and thirdly, the financial tools. And uh, uh, we also need to consider the uh, policy incentive to support such activities. And finally, to ensure that uh, these transition activities supported by finance are making just transition 
uh, namely they can mitigate negative impact on social uh, aspects. I dive a little bit into the details of these five elements. Firstly, on identification. Um, broadly speaking, uh, there are now two approaches towards identification of transition activities. One is what we call principle-based approach. Uh, this is used by the uh, Climate Transition Finance Handbook developed by ICMA and also contained in the basic guidelines on climate transition finance released by Japan. Um, so some organizations, some countries are uh, using this approach, uh, which does not include a specific list of transition activities, but simply state that uh, these are the principles. As long as you um, are consistent with the principles, we'll classify you as a transition activities. Uh, if uh, we sort of uh, uh, simplify the uh, principle-based approach and condense it into one sentence, essentially it says that uh, anything uh, that's uh, supporting a transition towards uh, uh, net zero uh, should be considered as a transition activity. So it's a broad and high level. The second approach, which is taken by EU already uh, as part of the uh, EU system of finance taxonomy and taken by parts of China in some region and by some banks, uh, what we call the uh, taxonomy-based approach. Um, in this approach, um, what we're seeing is that a list of specific transition activities, um, especially uh, with technical pathways, and uh, uh, these activities are classified in a table. And uh, those activities that can be found in a table uh, becomes the uh, transition activities recognized by uh, you know, whoever is producing the standard. And uh, such approach is adopted, as I said, by EU and parts of China and are now being considered by many other countries, uh, including uh, UK, uh, Canada, South Africa, uh, ASEAN and uh, a few other countries. We have uh, broadly agreed on some principles in designing such identification approaches, uh, which means that these approaches should help reduce the cost and transition wash risks, um, which means that it needs to provide some clarity relative to no approach. And secondly, um, these uh, transition activities could be uh, both projects or entity level activities. And thirdly, um, the approach needs to be dynamic and flexible, uh, which means that the, in the case of a taxonomy based approach, um, you are unable to exhaust all the possibilities. And at the end of the table, you probably want to include a sentence saying that the, uh, you know, other activities, uh, which the third party verifiers can prove that they belong to uh, transition activity towards net zero. Uh, can also be uh, considered as uh, transition activities. Of course, there are many other elements I don't have time to elaborate. Um, just showing you this chart on the seven uh, emerging principles. The second key element of this transition finance framework is reporting or disclosure. Uh, the main reason is that we need to prevent uh, uh, greenwash and some people now calling it a possibility of transition wash. Um, the key feature of the reporting framework should include the uh, transition strategy by the entity uh, that's making the transition, which is different from uh, the uh, green finance uh, disclosure requirements for project-based uh, activities. For example, it was a project, uh, for example, uh, buying equipment to, to uh, uh, reduce uh, energy uh, consumption, then you only need to report to the uh, activity associated with this uh, equipment uh, installation and how much reduction of carbon or energy consumption it can be achieved uh, within this particular transaction or project. But uh, for a transition activity, you need to report the company's transition strategy. And this strategy requires uh, uh, some more details, uh, including uh, goals and timelines and uh, science-based targets. And of course, um, the uh, historical data on emission, uh, GHG emission, scope one, scope two, and as appropriate, uh, you can include scope three. And uh, also uh, the governance to ensure the uh, proper implementation of this transition, as well as user proceeds and safeguard measures need to be reported. On policy incentives, there are no uh, good experience so far because uh, transition finance uh, uh, has been a fairly new thing uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, limited uh, examples we can find, but we can find actually a lot uh, 
from the green finance space. And I think many of these are in the form of uh, fiscal subsidies, tax incentives, government procurement, and the green finance uh, uh, related incentives. Uh, for example, in the case of China, the decarbonization facility offered by the PBOC, as well as sectorial uh, support measures, they can all be considered for transition activities as well. And uh, the fourth element is uh, what we call the uh, financial instruments to support transition activities. So far, what we're seeing in the market are largely debt instruments. For example, sustainability linked loans and bonds. And uh, there are emerging uh, demands for equity related instruments. Uh, for example, uh, in Europe, we have seen some transition funds already. And China is now considering setting up uh, uh, its own transition funds as well, largely uh, in the form of equity investments. And we can also turn many of the existing P and VC funds, bio funds, uh, maintenance financing facilities into something that support transition. And uh, this is a chart showing uh, globally the systematically linked loans and uh, systematically linked bonds. Uh, it's been growing very rapidly in the past couple of years. The final element of the transition finance framework is to identify and mitigate negative social impact of transition activities. The concern that's being raised in the G20 discussions are some transition activities may result in unemployment and some uh, may result in energy shortage and some may result in inflation. So these are the socioeconomic costs that we need to take into account in designing transition activities. And uh, uh, there are specific proposals now uh, on how to include the just element um, of the transition into a transition finance uh, framework. For example, uh, we can think about including an assessment of employment implication of the fundraiser transition plan. Namely, uh, if the company doing the transition will have to lay off people, uh, it needs to assess you know, how much layoff it's possibly happening and what are the mitigation measures they can take, for example, training or reskilling program they can offer, and also need to disclose uh, such information related to employment. And finally, uh, we need to consider whether it's possible to include employment performance measures like, uh, another, uh, like other KPIs, uh, which are included in the design of system linked products. Uh, just a few words on China initiative in this regard. The PBOC, namely the central bank in China is now leading the uh, development of national level transition finance framework. A working group has been set up in the past few years to work on uh, transition taxonomy for uh, four sectors. One is the coal-fired power generation, secondly, construction material, and thirdly, cement, and finally, agriculture. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the intention is that to come up with a list of uh, transition-related technical pathways, uh, which are recognized by the line ministries and uh, letting the financial institution, especially the bank, to identify such um, activities at a much lower cost than otherwise. Now, these uh, technical pathways actually are largely ready uh, in China because many line ministries uh, um, have published their um, technical pathways for different sectors. For example, NDRC uh, has published a action plan uh, for the steel sector, um, and also for many other carbon intensive manufacturing sector. And Minister of Housing has published a guideline on how to uh, decarbonize the building sector. So most of uh, such guidelines and the uh, 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 technical pathway um, can be used by the design of the uh, designer of the uh, transition finance taxonomy. And uh, some products are already issued. Um, for example, a few major banks have issued the systematically linked loans. And here are uh, just a few charts showing the uh, amount of a transaction in the past couple of quarters. And a few major banks in China, including Bank of China and the CCB, uh, namely the China Construction Bank, have published their own transition bond framework, which include their transition finance framework. Uh, that includes the list of activities as well as the threshold. Uh, for uh, the results, namely uh, how much decarbonization they can achieve uh, within a period of time for adopting such a technical pathways. Just a final few words on implication for Asia. 
Um, I think there are lots of implications, just more than uh, these uh, few points I can uh, highlight within a short period of time, but uh, uh, I'm suggesting three things. One is uh, um, Asia needs to develop its standards for transition activities, namely in the form of transition taxonomy, uh, so that it can reduce search cost for a uh, lot of finances, including banks, investors, and so on, as well as uh, guide the corporates um, to use the right technical pathways for transition. The second suggestion is on demonstration projects uh, because transition finance is new and in most places, most sectors, uh, the financial sector doesn't know what to do. Uh, they know the concept, but they have not seen a concrete example. And that's why they perceive the cost and risk being high. And uh, uh, that's why it's very important for uh, organizations like ADB to begin uh, launching demo demonstration projects in major sectors such as coal-fired power generation, steel, cement, and petrochemical to show that uh, such deals can be done and uh, uh, the perceived risks uh, can be substantially reduced as a result of demonstration projects. And finally, launching transition funds. Uh, they can be done either by the governments, for example, in China, it could be done by the national governments, local governments, and it could be done by international organizations like ADB, and uh, it could be also uh, a international collaborative efforts uh, done by you know, different country authorities in order to reduce the funding cost uh, for uh, these uh, transactions as uh, government participation uh, typically will send a very strong signal that uh, our policies will be supporting such transition and uh, the risk of uh, you know, being involved uh, will be reduced as a result of government participation through transition funds. So. I think I've used up my time. And uh, once again, let me thank ADB uh, for the invitation for me to join this uh, great forum. And I uh, wish the uh, uh, forum today uh, is a great success. Thank you very much. Back to you, Teresa. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma Jun, for sharing your thoughts on what it takes to finance climate transitions. Thank you for sharing the PRC's experience in developing the national level transition finance framework and for emphasizing its implications for the Asian Pacific region, particularly the importance of standards, demonstration projects, and transition funds. We will first take a group photo before we proceed further. Thank you very much, Dr. Majud, for sharing your thoughts. So, um, may I please request um, Dr. Malu, just stay there. Yes, please, Anubi, thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, can you open your camera, please? Um, when I try to open the camera, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I think it's opening now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We are done. We are good. Thank you. You can now close the camera. And uh, back to you, Teresa. Thank you, Akiko. Now, before we begin with the plenary session, we would like to have a quick overview of decarbonization efforts globally and in Asia and the Pacific. Questions we would like to ask include, what are the issues countries could possibly face as they decarbonize? What would be the role of disruptive technologies and concessional financing in decarbonization? And more importantly, we like to shed light in the very important question, what is a just transition? Mr. Jonathan Walters will brief us on these questions. He is an independent economist with more than 40 years of management and professional experience in energy, disruptive technology, climate change, and development aid strategies. Mr. Walters held various positions at the World Bank for more than 25 years, where he last served 
as the Director for Regional Programs and Partnerships in the Middle East and North Africa region. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jonathan Walters. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be addressing this forum uh, today. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my slides, please? Okay. I'll... Yes, we can see that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to make some very brief observations to set the context for decarbonization in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and I'd particularly like to pick up on one of the fundamental points that uh, VP Said made in his opening remarks. He, he talked about the need to pivot from a framework in which decarbonization is thought of as uh, sharing a burden and that countries uh, need to be compensated for sharing that burden and to pivot from that to seeing decarbonization as an opportunity decarbonization as as development as uh, vp said uh, called it and and i in my view that's that's an increasingly important uh, factor in all of our thinking about climate change mitigation and uh, decarbonization and and governments are sometimes struggling to know how to make that pivot because international agreements the united nations framework convention on climate change the, the paris agreement and so on tend to emphasize the um the burden sharing aspect or at least the way that negotiations um, and relationships are conducted within the framework of those agreements tends to emphasize that rather than emphasizing uh, the economic benefits, the development benefits of decarbonization. So it's a, it's a very genuine struggle, a very genuine dilemma that governments face in looking at decarbonization. But fundamentally, the economics of decarbonization has been improving quite rapidly in the last uh, few years, that some low carbon technologies are uh, cheaper relative to other technologies. Not, not all of them, of course, but an increasing number and increasingly uh, cheaper. Um, we should, of course, keep in mind that the underlying economics being, being cheaper is not everything, because often there are institutional uh, lock-ins to um, older, more expensive, carbon-intensive technologies. They can be locked in by long-term contracts, for example, a coal-fired power plant with a you know, 20 or 25-year power purchase agreement. Um, they can be locked in by just institutional inertia, risk aversion, um, monopoly power, particularly uh, state-owned enterprises protected from market competition, lack of up-to-date knowledge about the economics of different technologies and, and so on. So there are some real uh, institutional obstacles to, uh, to decarbonization as, as development. So those need to be addressed. And sometimes they can be addressed with, with transitional financing, with concessional financing in, in particular. Sometimes you can offset the obstacles, the institutional obstacles to decarbonization with financing that is uh, significantly cheaper than commercial uh, financing. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and this is really important, is that uh, you know, complementarities of technologies are, are often important in this, in this domain, particularly in infrastructure. For example, um, renewable energy technologies like solar power and wind power have become very cheap, but energy storage for all those periods when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing uh, are not yet that cheap. And since you need to use the storage with the renewable energy generation, it's the it's the complementarity, the cost of the complementarities that's that's really important, not just the cost of the individual uh, technologies. But just to just to emphasize, um, countries need sort of an increasing understanding and knowledge of the different sectoral issues and the different technology issues 
in order to be able to determine whether they should be focusing on decarbonization as development or still be in the framework of um, burden sharing. I just want to talk a little bit about what a disruptive technology is. It's, 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 a, it's a very important concept and VP Said mentioned that you can't think of these things in linear terms. You can't just think of marginal changes. You can have very sudden, very large changes because the prices of, of technologies can, can change a lot and they can pass below a certain price point, which um, we think of as a tipping point where suddenly something becomes so much cheaper than it was that it becomes very, very widespread. I mean, th think of um, you know, cell phones and smartphones. Uh, used to be that very few people had them because they were too expensive. And then very quickly, very suddenly, they got so cheap that, that, that we all had them. Uh, solar photovoltaic is a similar example. It, it passed some tipping points and became much more uh, widespread. What this means is that uh, when you're planning infrastructure, uh, you, you have to try and predict tipping points. Uh, which is slightly more scientific than, than, than crystal ball gazing, uh, but it's a very difficult process. You need to have as much um, knowledge and very granular, granular knowledge about what's happening in different sectors, what's happening with different technologies. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that when a new and disruptive technology is being introduced into a country, it's usually the case that because that country hasn't had much experience of that technology, they, they, they don't necessarily know how to, uh, the government doesn't necessarily know how to judge that technology and evaluate that technology. And quite often the private sector is where you can get that knowledge from because if, it's, if it has international experience, it may have worked with that technology somewhere else and can bring the benefit of that that knowledge to the country in question. So it's worth thinking about the relationship between disruptive technologies and the choice between the public and the private sector. Um, just a few words about concessional financing. Dr. Majun talked about this in the context of transition uh, financing. Um, within the context of the Paris Agreement or, the, or more broadly on the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, there is a responsibility of developed countries to provide below market financing, concessional financing to developing countries. There are various channels for, for that. Some of those channels are through multilateral development banks like the, the ADB. The important uh, element is to focus that uh, relatively scarce concessional financing on projects that have the biggest impact. Dr. Majun talked about demonstration projects, that's really uh, fundamental. Uh, but the main point to, to, to make is that you can change the relative costs of different technologies through uh, using concessional financing for those technologies that are, that are low carbon and that can change investment choices towards low carbon technology. Um, the concept of a just transition is increasingly on you know, everybody's minds because as you move away from carbon intensive uh, economic activity to low carbon um, uh, economic activity, it affects, it affects the people who've been working in the carbon intensive activity. The, the most obvious example is people who worked in, in the coal industry, either in coal mining or in coal uh, power. And when a country decides that it needs to move away from coal, either because of the, the basic economics or because of uh, um, uh, climate change mitigation considerations, then there needs to be a very uh, clear transition, just transition plan for those who are, have been working in that uh, industry. So you need to focus on how um, people are going to be retrained and reskilled, how physical assets can be best repurposed so they're not just uh, wasted, how the identity of communities uh, will best be pres preserved, um, how you'll get uh, reliable energy supply as you move away from baseload coal to, to something else and, and so on. Um, 
every country has its own experience of a just transition. There are things one can learn from other countries, but probably the, the most important lesson is that it's a complicated multi-dimensional process and you, you need to start out with a plan. It can't just be uh, left to, um, to chance and to you know, the market on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis. Um, just wanted to briefly mention that increasingly because of the concept of decarbonization as development, uh, increasingly people are trying to find integrated ways of planning uh, development and decarbonization uh, jointly. Um, one example of this uh, I wanted to mention is that the World Bank is pioneering what it's, what it's calling country climate and development reports, which are meant to be um, prepared closely with the governments uh, concerned and then to become somehow the strategy of both the government and of the World Bank and of, and of other development partners. This is, a, this is a new thing, but it's developing methodologies for how to model the development impact of decarbonization. Um, I really wanted to mention very strongly the, um, the emerging development that uh, some countries and trading blocs, uh, in particular right now the European Union, are going to start taxing the embedded carbon on uh, their imports. In other words, if they import, say, steel from, from uh, other countries, including from developing countries, and that steel is made in a carbon intensive process, then there will be a tax at the border of the EU on the carbon intensity of that steel. In other words, green steel will become more competitive uh, at the point of import than um, carbon intensive steel. And th this, this could have a major, major impact on the economics of um, exporting industries in, uh, in, in developing countries. Uh, and if the EU is doing it now, then we can expect other major um, export markets to start doing something similar over a period of time. And given that it, it takes a long time to make the kind of investments in industrial decarbonization that are called for by this type of carbon uh, border taxes, uh, starting now in anticipating that market change um, in, in, in a way, it's already too late, but, but, but better late than never. Um, this is something that countries are increasingly going to have to focus on how to decarbonize their industries to remain competitive in export markets. Um, so let me just draw some of these points uh, together in implications for Asia-Pacific countries. Uh, countries need decarbonization strategies that are um, formed around the idea that some technologies are disruptive, some technologies are getting much, much cheaper, and the, the shift to low carbon technologies is a, is, is, um, is, a, is a development strategy and countries can use their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions as a way of formulating those strategies. Um, just to emphasize again that concessional financing flows are are very important in overcoming uh, obstacles to decarbonization and in um, expanding the deployment of, of disruptive low carbon technologies so that they benefit from uh, learning effects and from economies of, of scale. Um, decarbonization strategies need to focus on the complementarity of different uh, technologies. You can't plan one technology at a time, just transitions need an overarching uh, plan. Um, and uh, just to emphasize again the point that countries are likely to start facing taxation on the, on the carbon embedded in their exports. So need to be thinking very, very carefully about how to do industrial decarbonization. Um, let me stop there. Thank you very much for the, um, the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Walters, for that very extensive overview on decarbonization.
we hear the challenge for developing countries to see decarbonization as an opportunity while mitigating costs, maximizing benefits from disruptive technologies, and deploying concessional financing to accelerate technologies that support climate action. Decarbonization is indeed development, an opportunity for us all to plot a more sustainable future. Without decarbonization, not only will our ambitious targets under the Paris Agreement be far from reach, but it will also place our future in an uncertain trajectory. Without urgent climate actions, our future growth could be severely affected and our current development gains reversed. With that, allow me to thank our speakers for joining us today in opening our first ever East Asia Forum and for sharing their thoughts and even hopes for a low carbon future. Thank you to all our audience who have stayed on and listened to what our speakers had to share. We hope that you have been inspired, if not challenged by their presentations and are ready to join and contribute to the discussions during this East Asia Forum today and tomorrow. Thank you very much and see you in the next sessions of the East Asia Forum.